Welcome to Real Vision Crypto. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, I'm joined by Corby Pryor, venture partner at Hoff Capital, formerly head of blockchain at the same. We talk today about the metaverse, Web3, cross-chain blockchains, decentralized time, and much, much more. Corby, welcome to Real Vision Crypto. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. You know, we were talking a little bit off camera. You have a fascinating academic background. Tell us a little bit about what you did before you got into the blockchain space. Yeah, so I was the first person to graduate with a quantum computing and photonic engineering degree at, uh, from University of Pennsylvania. I, how I got there was interesting because I wanted to, well, coming out of high school, I was very passionate about physics. And while I was passionate about physics, I knew I wanted to make money. So I had to go figure out what problem I should solve that's going to do that. And around 2016, 2017, that was right around the time where Moore's Law was starting to slow down. And Moore's Law is, this, is the idea that the computing industry will be able to get exponential performance out of computers by reducing the size of the individual components every year and a half, every two years. But there's a problem with that because there's only so much that you can miniaturize before you hit quantum mechanics and then eventually splitting the atom. So it doesn't make sense for Moore's Law to continue forever, which means that the industry has to can, you know, maintain its performance trajectory. You got to find different architectures. And that was really the problem that I was trying to solve when I first got to Penn. And that led me to, you know, focus on three different computing architectures. Quantum computing was the main one that I was studying at Penn. And then there was, I took a look at neuromorphic computing, which is how do we get the architecture of the brain and put it onto a chip, as well as blockchain architecture. So... At the time, all three of those looked like they didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so neuromorphic. So I'll start with neuromorphic computing because that one's interesting. The reason why it doesn't work right now is because just like cells in the brain that die, the individual components on the neuromorphic chips die just like brain cells. So there's no way to get brain-inspired hardware that could in theory be really useful for AI and machine learning, but just not there yet because we can't figure out how to keep these chips alive. The blockchain I started doing in 2017, primarily from a trading perspective, but then also a bit on the smart contract level. And that was just a really confusing time period. It was hard to see the use case. The, I mean, I had people asking me to do like big peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin arbitrage with people in Venezuela and there was false volumes in, in on the exchanges and it just there seemed like there was just too much noise and uh, sketchy people at the time and it was in large part true. It's a completely different story now. Hmm. And then with quantum computing, which is what I mainly focused on the academic side, I would characterize that experience as trying to get a whole bunch of different types of computers to work when they don't really work. So I should say you and I met at a party a couple of months ago, and I was just very impressed by your knowledge of this space. Uh, but also, you know, you're a young guy, obviously very near the beginning of your career, and yet you already have a track record as an institutional investor. Tell us a little bit about the transition to Hoff Capital uh, and what you were so passionate about doing in the investment space. When I realized that I was too early for all these computing paradigms. Uh, the only way that I could really see myself staying at the frontier of tech was through early stage VC. And when I linked up with Hoff Capital, that was summer of 2020, the summer of COVID. And I got there. I knew nothing about VC. I did not know how tech companies worked. I didn't even I didn't understand how much of the world worked actually <laughs> i only understood how computers worked and so uh, i credit those it's a pretty good for start for me. yeah i i got super lucky every single time those guys gave me a really great foundation 
uh, in terms of just how to evaluate companies. And it's been an exciting ride. We, when I got there that summer, it was around a 40 million AUM fund. And as of today, it's, I think, over 1.1 billion. And we didn't really scale our team with the AUM. So it's been very crazy. So let's talk a little bit about the technologies you were investing in. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, Metaverse, Web3, uh, cross-chain blockchains, and decentralized time. Talk a little bit about those areas. Uh, there are obviously some things that are very much kind of ahead of the curve right now uh, that people who are really interested in the space from the computer science side are talking about, uh, but are still not yet broadly known outside of the digital asset space. Tell us a little bit about why those things are so significant. I think it's helpful to contextualize some of these focus areas within the, the, you know, the history of why Bitcoin was created. And ultimately, it was to create a better financial system that was secure and trustless. And what really opened up my eyes during my experience at Hoff was when I was, it was during DeFi summer, which for people who weren't there, it's like hot girl summer, but for crypto nerds. And uh, I was trying to wire money on a weekend from my bank account to do some interest rate arbitrage on Aave and Compound. And when I realized that I had to wait until Monday for the bank to open, I realized that the blockchain financial infrastructure was going to be the was going to be the design that wins out. And so when we're designing financial infrastructure, we have to make sure that the system is as secure as possible. We cannot build janky technology. What happens when you build a janky technology or janky infrastructure is that you have something like 2008, where basically a collapse of an entire system that was basically the biggest rug pull in human history with 10 million people losing their homes. And when we're building Web3 and the metaverse, we have to make sure that that can't happen again. And we're unfortunately in this weird position where we are designing systems that might fail and are somewhat failing. You guys, I know that you were talking about this with Robin and Camillo on a podcast last week about yeah. Solana wormhole being bailed out by junk capital. Not every single bridge is going to be able to be bailed out by Big Jump. So, so let me just give a little bit of a context here for people uh, who may not be f uh, familiar with the story. Uh, so what Corby's talking about here uh, is this idea uh, that there was a, a significant failure in Wormhole. This was a bridge between Solana and Ethereum, uh, a cross-chain bridge where assets could be transferred across. It was a massive failure. Uh, I forget the exact number, but it was into the hundreds of millions of dollars, two or three hundred million uh, dollars lost. And it was ultimately backstopped by Jump Capital. Uh, Corby, one of the things that I think people who don't have your computer science background struggle with is understanding what the challenges are in building these systems in layman's terms. Why is this so complicated? Particularly these cross-chain bridges seem to be uh, major material technology problems uh, that just haven't been solved yet. Absolutely. It's one of those systems that I think the space as a whole hasn't really been able to diagnose the problem. Because when we're, originally when we were talking about crypto interoperability, we were thinking about getting tokens from point A to point B. Now you can d get tokens from ch chain A to chain B and no problem. It's actually not that complicated. But to do it in a secure way, that's the problem. That's the challenge, right? So if you wanted to transfer... If you wanted to send cash from a bank, from two different banks, you send an armed car with armed guards, and it's a very robust process because if you send that millions of dollars in a golf cart between banks, it's going to get robbed or exploited. The problem here is that we have actually have not figured out how to secure the communication channel between two blockchains. And... The way that I think about it is that a blockchain is a database and the, the database stores assets. 
and these assets need to be secured somehow. So what is actually securing it? Well, it's the consensus layer built into the protocol. And the way to think about the consensus layer is that it is code that sets the laws and the rules of the network. So everything that happens within this consensus layer is allowed to happen and is safe and secured. And the way that the, these laws of the consensus are enforced are through the de decentralized validator nodes, which are constantly checking every transaction to make sure that it is in accordance with the law effectively. What does that mean for cross-chain? If we want to have secured communication between two different databases, then we ultimately need to have consensus layer that's designed to regulate the laws between chains. So if we, in the wormhole hack, there was nothing, nothing went wrong on the Ethereum side. The consensus, the security was maintained. Nothing went wrong on Solana's side. Security was maintained. But the problem was that there was no consensus securing the, tra the transactions between the two. So how do you actually go about fixing that is that you need to build a cross-chain bridge directly into the consensus layer of these protocols. And what that looks like is instead of a validator node just validating and coming to consensus on transactions the network it's also validating and proving the state of the other chain so if you're writing validator if you're if you're a validator node you have to put some code into your program and the only way to secure a bridge is if you just take the code for a bridge and you put it into the validator node itself so its job is to maintain the laws of the network it's operating on, as well as the laws, the laws between different chains. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.